Hello all sentient beings and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode where we talk about all news, comics, and media related to the... On this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode, we review Dreamwave Transformers Generation 1 Issue 1. Diamond sees light at the end of the tunnel, and how much longer will multiplayer be available on Transformers War for Cybertron and Rise of the Dark Spark? Today is Friday, April 24th, 2020, and this is episode 178 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast that has a dull surprise for you this week in our comic review. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team, Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Uh, hey, how's it going? And Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. Hi. Let's talk Transformers. All right. As always, we start off by thanking our Donatrions, those lovely people who give us money on Patreon and PayPal to help keep the show going. Thank you so much for your continued support. And if you would like to become a Donatron, if you aren't already, just go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support. If you'd like to buy some merchandise, you can go to our Public store at transmissionspodcast.com slash shop. You can also check out uh, our friend of the show, K-Girl. Her art, she's an artist who's done a lot of work for us in the past. She has her own tpublic.com store at tpublic.com slash user slash superstar K. And this week, uh, everything at Tee Public is 35% off. So uh, that is, I believe, ending today. It was supposed to be last week, but it got postponed. And now it's hopefully this week, and it wasn't postponed again. Uh, but yeah, you can buy everything at Tee Public for 35% off. That includes everything in our store and everything throughout the site. So if you use our link and buy something that helps us out, will you still get the huge 35% off discount. Uh, also, next Monday is Empire of Rust episode 22. You get a ship if I get a trip. So that's coming out to just this Monday. And I hope you enjoy the continuing story of Empire of Rust. All right, let's jump into some comics news. So uh, first up, we've got the... Manga for Takara Tomy's Generation Select Super Megatron. Uh, so this is now translated in uh, from Japanese to English. So if you are curious about the backstory for the Super Megatron figure we talked about last week in the toy show, the comic is there and it's all translated in English. So you can enjoy that. Uh, these comics are, they're usually kind of fun and wacky and they kind of, you know, tie in many iterations of the Transformers universes uh, from the Japanese perspective. So next up, uh, we've got a letter from Diamond, the comics distributor, uh, and uh, this was uh, sent out throughout the industry to a bunch of comic shops. Uh that they are planning to start shipping back up in May, so late May. And they're, you know, they're asking for patience as they, you know, try to get everything squared away. So uh, for this temporary pause, uh, it'll be about a month and a half, and then they are trying to have uh, comic shipping back up. It'll be interesting to see, like, what publishers have, like, exclusive deals or what which ones are able to break it because DC was just like, nah, we're getting some new distributors because their deal had been rumored to be up Hmm. and they're starting next week. (laughs) So (laughs) I I would imagine the smaller publishers like IDW probably are exclusive to diamond. It's an interesting time. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm sure, you know, with, with the, the news with DC kind of basically leaving them that, that probably spurred them into action to try and mm-hmm. convince any of their other big clients not to, not to do that. So, well, there's also the the news that they are not paying the publishers, at least like they're paying a portion. And then each, I think each month or each week they're paying like a portion of the remainder. It's not, like financially, it's not looking good for Diamond. They they are mm. 
for for a a monopoly in this like <laughs> billion dollar business, they didn't seem to have much runway with their money. Mm. Interesting. All right, and our last bit of comics news uh, comes from Twitter and longtime Transformers comics writer James Roberts. So you remember, may remember him from More Than Meets the Eye and Lost Light, the long-running series from IDW that just wrapped up la- last year or two years ago now at this point. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, James Roberts uh, broke into uh, I mean, before he was a an, a, a an official writer for Transformers Media, he wrote fanfic and he actually published a huge fanfic as a novel. And it was Eugenesis called Transformers Eugenesis. It was a basically a uh, a storyline that followed in the Marvel UK comics continuity. So it basically took the entire Marvel UK comics continuity as its backstory and then wrote an original story uh, kind of wrapping that up or or tying into that. Uh, And this got him noticed by the Transformers fan community. Uh, You know, a lot of people uh, took notice of this, uh, this book. Uh, And I think even uh, in the early days of IDW, Nick Roche snuck a reference to it into uh, Maximum Dinobots that the miniseries that he did art on, he's, he's just, a uh, snucky eugenicist like a, like someone had the book in their in their bookshelf in the in a panel on you of uh maximum dinobots uh so you know this i think this got him noticed by uh by fans and then also uh you know through through uh his friendship with nick roche that got him uh, got him an in into idw and then the rest is history so this is kind of a you know this is kind of a seminal work a lot of the uh, some of the characters that made it into more than meets the eye and lost light show up in eugenesis uh so in particular rung the psychiatrist he is uh he, the character first appears in eugenesis so you know there's a there's some interest uh, from the fan community uh it is available online for free you know you can probably just google it and download it uh, but the physical copy, there's only been, I think he produced like 200 or so for, for people who wanted a physical copy back in the day. 150. Oh, well, there you go. So not a lot. There aren't a lot out in the wild. So uh, uh, this is very hard to find. So what he's doing is auctioning off one of his copies. Uh, he started the bidding at $100. Uh, the auction... Uh, ended uh, April 23rd, so before this podcast goes up, it's already over. But at the time we're recording this, it's it's only been up for a couple of days. And starting at $100, it's already up to $600. So <laughs> by the time this show goes up, I don't know what it'll be, but uh, it'll be a lot. And the he's do- the, basically the, um, the money is being donated to charity, the um, uh, Book Industry Charitable Foundation. And uh, the winner just donates the money directly to them, and then Roberts will ship the book to you. So I did, uh, you know, I tried to bid on this, but you know, it's, <laughs> it things quickly escalated, and I was I was not able to, to hang in there. So is there even too rich for your doctor money? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I I can't spend that much on the. <laughs> I mean, it, it's it's something I'd like to have, but. I can't spend more than Unicron on this. <laughs> I already bought Unicron. <laughs> Watch, you're going to be surprised. and like, it, it's going to be won by your wife as a surprise for you. Because <laughs> that, that would just be the, one of the, something like she would do. That would be awesome. I don't, but I, I don't, I don't think you, you know, at these prices, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I, I would be very surprised. I would be happy, but I'd be very surprised. Yeah. But hey, the people listening to this right now already know who won. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, if it's me, something crazy happened. <laughs> so I'm guessing it's not me because I'm. I, I mean, I'm. I'm going to predict this is. This might end up at over a thousand dollars, but we'll see. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, so it's just interesting. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it's for a good cause, so that's that's cool. I'm just you know, I didn't. I didn't think people were, you know, it was that sought after as, uh, you know, I mean, and it is, I mean, it is really a, a cool, interesting part of 
kind of non-official Transformers history. So we'll see. Congratulations to the winner. We also have an auction from Casey Collar. He's auctioning two comics uh, and a sketch cover for charity. Just a sketch. Oh, just a sketch. Okay. Oh, and an eight by a Megatron original eight by ten inch uh, original art, and all hail Megatron! Ah, all hail Megatron number one, the Killing Joke variant, and all hail Megatron number twelve, the uh, Megatron No More variant. So those are two classic covers from All Hail Megatron. Uh, Killing Joke, based of course on the Batman Killing Joke cover, and then all hail the uh, Megatron No More, based on Spider Man No More uh, cover. So two classic covers uh i did get the all hail megatron cover for twenty dollars <laughs> back in the day uh thank you marion <laughs> but uh yeah these i mean and, and this will all this is also going uh to the same charity uh so yeah what is the is the what is the bidding up to for this one right now it looks like 380 so this one yeah this one ended even earlier than robert's one so yeah yeah it ends on monday Yep. Or ended on Monday, the 20th. Heavy. <laughs> Time travel is hard. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I I, I think this these are uh it's cool that, that artists and writers are are putting up stuff for auction in these times to help. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone in this uh, the whole pandemic situation, a lot of people are hurting, so this is a good cause. All right. Uh so, let's move on to our comic review. And this week, we do not have any new IDW comics, uh, unsurprisingly. So we decided to go back and do a classic review. Although it's not it's not super classic. It's kind of... It is 20 years ago, but it's not G1. Or it kind of is G1. I don't know. <laughs> you can decide. But this is Dreamwave. We're going back to Dreamwave. This was the first uh resurgence of Transformers comics uh, since the original series ended in the early 90s. This was the first uh Transformers branded property to use Generation 1 as part of its uh its title. So this was kind of a retroactive thing put on the original Transformers series because back in the day they when Transformers uh first had a it had its kind of first mini reboot in the early 90s they called it transformers generation 2 and so that retroactively named the original transformers transformers generation 1 and that was something that the fan community kind of took up and, and used regularly but this was the first official media that called something transformers generation 1 to say no this is we're focusing on the original 80s property we're not just doing a re imagination of Transformers, we're doing a um, a going back to the beginning, back to the basics, and focusing on the original characters. So this was the this was I think this is notable, and that's the first media to do that. So uh, this week we're going to review issue one of the first mini series of Dreamwave. Uh, so this was uh, Transformers Generation One. There's a pre there's a four page preview that came out before that, so we're going to talk about that, and then issue one. And uh, I guess we we will also talk about the whole uh, Dreamwave. There's there's a larger story of Dreamwave. I don't think we'll we'll go in too in depth, but uh, this was uh, I mean it's interesting because 2002 Transformers at least for I think for most people was uh, you know it was still the, there was new stuff happening for kids like the 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 Beast Machines was over then Robots in Disguise the Japanese cartoon had been imported over. Uh, and then they were gearing up for Transformers Armada. That was the first kind of really, I guess, big reboot of Transformers uh, that you know focused on the going back to the basics of like vehicle-based Transformers uh, since it had been Beast Wars for the last few years. And so this was you know this was a, a big turning point for Transformers and comics. Transformers comics had not been really active for a long time since the early nineties and the company dreamwave decided, you know, they, they were a small independent company 
Pat Lee had done a lot of of art of fan art for Transformers. It, you know, a lot of his images were were being shown passed around the internet. I had one of his images as my computer desktop background for a long time. Uh, you know, it was a, it was a really taking that anime style and applying it to the classic Transformers was was something people really responded to. And you know, through I think through that artwork getting noticed. I think he got it published in wizard uh, magazine at one point. And I think that that gave him the in to work with Hasbro and, and capture the license, get, you know, convince Hasbro to, to let them use the license for transformers comics again. And of course, Hasbro was interested in, in selling their new toys. So they had to have a transformers armada comic, but as part of that, they were also given the license to do, uh, quote unquote generation one comics. And uh, so they took advantage of this. And this also in the early two thousands, like, uh, you know, like the kids now who have grown up with the movie based transformers, they're now coming into their disposable income and and looking back at those masterpiece movie toys in 2002. This was the time when all us kids uh, who'd grown up with transformers in the eighties were now, adults uh you know graduated college or in college and had some income and uh were you know looking to recapture their childhood and transformers comics definitely rode that uh that wave of nostalgia all the way to the bank so i think this this kind of kicked off the nostalgia boom for trans for for comp for comic series in general i think this you know we had a whole host of 80s properties getting new comics in the next few years but transformers really hit a had it captured this this uh this idea and and really i mean they they outsold the big two in the in these uh this mini this first mini series they sold over a hundred thousand copies of each of these uh these comics which is you know these days those numbers are unheard of for any comics really and and in the early 2000s it was still unusual but yeah i mean transformers comics beating Batman beating Spider-Man that's seems unfathomable but they did it so uh the quality of the work I mean I I think we'll we'll have a discussion about that but there's no denying that they captured lightning in a bottle with the the nostalgia craze in the in the early 2000s and we'll talk about uh you know <laughs> other stuff that happened after that so Pat Lee is a controversial figure um you know some some of the work he did. It's not necessarily clear he actually did it, uh, and he also had a habit of not paying artists and writers for their work, uh, and mismanaged the money in Dreamwave, and that eventually caused Dreamwave to implode. Uh, so that's the sad kind of uh, end story. But at the time the, the first comics were published, this was not this. No one really knew about that, but. Uh, at definitely in the beginning, it seemed like this was a bright new future for Transformers comics. So, all right. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts about, I mean, I don't know, were you, were you guys collecting comics at the time, uh, when these came out or is this something that you kind of picked up later on? It kind of got me back because I was like out of comics for financial reasons because I was a college student. And then around this time I was getting a job, like you said, it was like about that time. And Mm -hmm. that was just kind of when I was like getting some of the reissue figures that were coming out and then the comics it just, it got me back into comics in general. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My story is similar to Jeremy's actually the, uh, the first two issues. I think it was, I missed, I had no idea that it was happening. I stumbled into a comic store because I think I was waiting for a bus or something for college. I uh, I went uh, into the store just to kind of dink around while I was waiting, and I was like, Transformers in comic book form? All right, cool. So I picked one up. I ended up backtracking to uh, the n- get number one of this series. I ended up buying like the third print of it because one yeah. and two were sold out. And, uh, and then I think I got number two as a second print or something like that. Um, but it was, uh, you know, it was, um, 
Yeah, I don't never remember getting the the preview that uh, we're going to talk about, but I may have picked it up after the fact. I think I've probably got got it now. But uh but yeah, after that I had set up uh I set up a pull list with the comic book store that I stumbled into. Uh turned out being a really shitty store that I ended up dink, uh like leaving after the second uh, mini series ended. But yeah, I I I went with them for a while and I was like, yeah, I'm going to get these Transformers comics if they're coming out. Yeah. Cool. One thing I did mention, I wanted to mention, because I probably will forget when we're done here, is these, what I found out when I was reading them, is these comics were actually produced and printed in Canada, which was kind of cool for me. I was, you know, (laughs) being a Transformers fan and, and being able to read in the book that, hey, these things were being, you know, written by people living in Canada and being produced the company was in canada dreamwave productions was in canada just down the 401 from me in markham and you know the printing pro- uh, process was being done in canada as well i was like this is a transformers comic that's in canada what the hell we, you know wh- where is this being done i want to be there let me go there and uh, <laughs> um i never end up ended up doing it but it was uh i was pretty stoked that it was all happening in uh, in my country so yeah L- you know fast forward a few years and i was very very disappointed in these people <laughs> well just pat lee right <laughs> and, and yeah. his, i guess just pat lee and roger lee <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> all right well let's uh let's talk about the actual issue and then we'll we'll give our thoughts all right so this is uh transformers generation one volume one uh, the preview, which I'm calling issue zero, and then issue one. So this is written by Chris Saracini, pencils by Pat Lee, inks by Rob Armstrong, backgrounds by Edwin Garcia, colors by The Real T, graphic design, Paul Villafuerte, Villa, Villa Villa, Villa letters by Dreamer Design, and pre-press by Kello Graphics. So, uh, issue zero will, uh, is a, just a four page preview, but it has a, a little, you know, it's a little story that, that leads into the first issue. So somewhere in the Arctic, the mysterious man known only as Lazarus leads a potential investor through the frozen wasteland on foot, promising it will be worth his while. The investor is not happy to be subjected to these harsh conditions and complains loudly with a bad sports metaphor. Lazarus ignores his complaints as they continue on through the snow. Finally, the investor is fed up with his shabby treatment and tries to grab Lazarus's arm in protest to get his attention. Lazarus reacts violently, twisting the man's arm and shoving him face first into the snow. The man decides to stop complaining. After Lazarus lets him up, he continues to follow behind meekly. Perhaps as an apology for the rough treatment of his guest, Lazarus decides to provide a bit more explanation about what he's offering. He tells a story about a race of mighty gladiators who fell to earth long ago. Their strength, speed, and ability to fly were eclipsed by their most powerful ability of all. They could transform. The man still doesn't understand what Lazarus is talking about, but they finally approach their destination. Lazarus' team is digging in the ice, and they found something, something big. As they reach the dig site, Lazarus presents his prize, the deactivated body of a Transformer, the Decepticon Soundwave, buried in the ice. The investor needs no more convincing and is ready to cut a check right there. And that was the tease that Transformers were coming back in a big way. And, you know, sets up the mystery of who is this Lazarus? Why is Soundwave stuck in the ice? What happened? Where did the Transformers go? Why is he dead? And we'd get answers later on, but uh, not in the first issue. At least not not the full story in the first issue. So that takes us to issue one. Uh, I guess we should we can talk about the covers. Uh, so the first i i had i did get the like the first printing so uh the first you know when they first came out there were three covers the foil cover uh the autobot cover and the decepticon cover i showed them off in trips to the store this week so you can check that out in transformers 378 uh, 
And since there were a second and third printing, they got different covers in the second and third printing. Uh, the second printing is Optimus Prime with Bumblebee and car mode standing you know, right next to him. The third printing is Omega Supreme uh, and uh, fighting against the Decepticons. And uh, then we have a retailer incentive cover with uh, Superion and Devastator. So uh, the Autobot and Decepticon covers are by Pat Lee. The foil cover is by James Reyes. The second printing cover and third printing covers are both by Pat Lee. And the incentive cover is by Pat Lee with the main characters, but then the backgrounds are credited to uh, James Reyes. So, uh, Daryl, which of these covers is your favorite? Um, well, I in uh, recent years, I've been able to pick up the Chromium one just because it's Chromium and it's awesome. Um, and I do still have my Omega Supreme third printing. But I think probably the uh, the Devastator Superion one is probably the coolest one that I don't have. And uh, I probably would still buy it if I found it. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a cool looking image. Cool. Jeremy, what about you? I I would probably, just, I, I never got the Chromium one, but I really like that image with the, like, especially the number of bots in there. And I've all like, even like around this time is when I was introduced to James Reyes's art. And I, I still love his art. You know, he's come so, you know, so far from this to, you know, you see the things he does now with like, all the Star Wars characters from every movie in one image. And, you know, just to see what he was able to do, even at this early stage of his career, I think it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm I'm not a fan of the overall Dreamwave style of kind of the more rounded features, but this is still a good image. I love it. Cool. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that it stands out because since it's James Ray is in, He's not. Uh, I mean, I think one of the, one of the one of the criticisms of the Dreamwave uh, art is that they all had to kind of follow the Pat Lee house style, mm-hmm. and I think the the James Ray's cover breaks away from that a little bit compared to the other ones. And um, I, I think I, I agree with you, Jeremy, that I I, I think that covers the my pick as well. In particular, that like the, just looking at the the Autobot cover. I mean, one of the criticisms for is that if you look at Optimus Prime and the perspective, it's like it's it's Rob Liefeld levels of not understanding <laughs> perspective in terms of like where the arms and legs are and their proportions and placement to the body and where Optimus Prime's head is like uh, you can you can if you Google this this image and the, there are analyses where you can show like how how is his head connected to his body, given the, you know, where the the his arm is there and it's it's very (laughs) it's just uh you know despite the fact that it's i I think it's still it's still cool and pretty but it does play fast and loose with the perspective there yeah i will say i did get the one with megatron all the septicons um i this is one of the first variant comics i ever got was i think it was at botcon 2004 i picked up Australian versions of these, uh, like it was three issues that had two comics in each issue and issue one had that Megatron cover on it. Hmm. So if I can dig it up, I'll show it off next week. Cool. All right. Well, let's talk about the story. So early in the morning in a jungle in South America, two thugs are guarding a rebel campsite. Patrol at 3.42 in the morning is usually pretty uneventful, and these guys are bored. But their boredom is interrupted when a giant metal monster somehow silently catches them by surprise. The monster crushes the first guard in its giant metal hand and then stomps on the other one with a giant metal foot. But the monster is just getting started as an explosion incinerates the rest of the camp. Far away in Cleveland, Ohio, that morning, Spike Witwicky is getting ready for work. His son Daniel stops him before he leaves to make sure he doesn't forget his hard hat. Spike playfully rubs his head as he tells his son to get ready for school. But Spike won't make it to work today. 
As he prepares to leave, there are two visitors at his door. General Hallow, head of the DWT, Developing War Technology Department at the Pentagon, has come to collect Spike for a very important mission. Spike hesitates, but the general explains that his presence is required, not requested. Further north, in the Northwest Territories of Canada, in the Arctic Circle... The mysterious Lazarus drives a potential customer in an army jeep to an undisclosed location. The customer has to wear a bag over his head to maintain the secrecy of the location. Lazarus is offering the next evolution in warfare to the highest bidder, including terrorists and dictators around the world. This customer is one of those unsavory individuals. As they drive on, the customer expresses skepticism about Lazarus' product. Lazarus promises he won't be disappointed. They arrive at a checkpoint, but they have to leave their vehicle behind to go the rest of the way on foot. Had the customer been able to, he would have been astonished to see the Jeep transform into a humanoid figure and stand guard. As they finally reach their destination, Lazarus points out that his new customer, Bishop, has been fighting a losing battle in his fight for freedom. The reason, according to Lazarus, is his soldiers are obsolete. What if his troops didn't just hold weapons, but could become weapons themselves? Bishop has no idea what Lazarus is talking about, but when the bag is removed from his head, he finally understands. Back at the Pentagon, Spike waits in a hallway for his meeting with the general's team. While he's waiting, he's accosted by a creepy old janitor who tells him there's more than meets the eye around here. But Spike doesn't get to inquire further as General Hallow's assistant shoos the old man away while simultaneously bringing Spike into the DWT command center. General Hallow finally explains why they've brought Spike here. Three years ago, after the Autobots united with the governments of Earth to finally defeat the Decepticons, the Ark-2 left Earth, taking the Autobots and their Decepticon prisoners back to Cybertron, along with a few human explorers. But they never made it. Due to some unknown cause, the ship exploded in orbit, killing everyone on board. That included Spike's father, Sparkplug. But apparently the Transformers were not obliterated, and Megatron has resurfaced. They have satellite footage of Megatron attacking a rebel camp in South America. Back in Lazarus' base, he presents one of his new products to the potential buyer. Lazarus' team has complete control of Megatron and several other Transformers, and they will carry out their commands efficiently and without hesitation. Lazarus demonstrates by ordering Megatron to move his arms. But for some reason, Megatron doesn't comply when Lazarus orders him to kneel before him. Lazarus writes it off as just a simple glitch and takes Bishop on a tour of the other bots they have for sale. But he doesn't notice when Megatron's eyes glow with fury. In the U.S., General Hallow takes Spike to a secret government facility to explain why they need him. With the return of Megatron, they needed a Transformer of their own to balance the scales. Spike is incredulous. They found one of the Transformers? Which one? As they enter the hangar, Spike sees the unconscious form of Optimus Prime. To be continued. And that was... The mind-blowing first issue of Transformers Generation 1. So, um, there's a lot of complicated feelings <laughs> about Dreamwave. I mean, I'll try to separate my thoughts now from my thoughts back then. I mean, I was, as as someone who was starved for Transformers content and Transformers comics in the early 2000s, this was just a welcome return to transformers having just anything focused on transformers and trying to update it and, and take the story a little bit further than what we got in the cartoon back in the eighties. I mean, this was still, uh, it's 2002. We're still, um, you know, having the kind of the nineties edge, super edgy comics. Uh, you know, that's, that's still, uh, um, you know, in the back of our minds going forward. The art is, of course, uh, it's it's very, I would say, anime esque in terms of you know taking that anime style and and applying it to Transformers. It was, you know, a, it was a reason to get hyped for for new Transformers stories. 
it, it was also this is not a reboot. This was continuing the '80s stories. Like you get you get a hint, and they have this little newspaper article clipping that's a little bit of backstory where it's you know it's clearly the Transformers from the '80s. They crashed uh, you know into Mount Saint Hillary and four million years ago. Woke up in the '80s and then started their war again. All that stuff is backstory for this new story, and but it's set in the modern day. It's set in 2002. Uh, so at the time, you know, there was a lot of speculation. Well, is this, you know, are these stories going to lead up to the movie? Because, you know, the movie happened in 2005, right? So we could very easily have our stories lead into that, you know, these new stories. Uh, that's only That's only three years away, so... I think, you know, and the art was, you know, the art was really the, 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 just the quality of the paper, the quality of the, the artwork was, you know, leaps and bounds above what we got with, with Marvel. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of prestige comics, I guess you could say is, uh, you know, looking high quality. So yeah, I mean, I was I was hyped like like everyone else for you know any every tra- I think a lot of Transformers fans were hyped for Transformers comics you know back in the day. Kind of taking a look at it now, uh, there are <laughs> I mean I'd say there are there just significant problems. I mean we mentioned in the intro a lot of the facial expressions uh, they're all the same. <laughs> that dull surprise that's a that's a meme that that came out of uh pat lee's artwork and it's really on like if you just look on display here look through the book every character's face every human character's face is kind of the same expression and uh it's a little bit off-putting but i mean the other the other part is it, there's not a lot of transformers in in this these first this first transformers comic i mean i think uh, having a slow start, I, I think we can forgive that. I mean, definitely the IDW series also did that, where you start off, you 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 ease into the Transformers concept very slowly. Uh, but you know, this, I I think, and this will be a lar- this may be as a larger discussion for the how the series ended up. I think the potential here in the first issue was there's a lot. It was very promising, but I think things. <laughs> things went off the rails in later issues, but you know, I don't, I don't hold that against this first issue, but so, yeah, I mean, I, I was, I was, I w- was really excited for this and looking forward to this. Uh, but you know, looking at, looking at it now is 20, 20 years later or 20 or 18 years later from, uh, it's, uh, I, I can't untangle my eventual disappointment with, with the, with the series and then i mean I, just the fir- the first series i think it was a, like ended for me ended a, didn't end on a positive note but later dreamwave series i think got better over time but then of course the company imploded and we didn't get to see anything of where it ended up uh but yeah so i i got a lot of complicated feelings is what i'm trying to say <laughs> So I'll let someone else talk, <laughs> Daryl. Daryl, what did, what did you think? The uh, I mean, the art is is. I'm trying to think about how I felt back then when I was reading it, and the art was okay. I think at the time I was in your same similarly to you. I was just I was really happy to to be getting something that was Transformers related. I can remember reading this first issue, and. When you're you're on the page, I think it's page two or whatever. Yeah, so page two, and you see the hand kind of coming out of the forest, grabs the guy and takes him away, and then the foot comes down and squashes him. You're like, okay, you know, that's the Transformers foot. That's the Transformers hand. Okay, cool. Then you 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 know you go through some dialogue, blah blah blah, and then you see somebody uh, driving a jeep, and you're like that's hound that's got to be hound okay Mm -hmm. right and then the next page is more driving and then the next page they get out and hound transforms but it doesn't show his face you're like cool you know you're getting a little it's a little bit of excitement you're like okay they're 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 getting into it slowly they're building the the characters of you know the human characters of the of the the world and this is more for transformers fans they know that 
who know the Transformers characters. You don't need to to know the Transformers characters to get this. You need to know who the humans are that they're dealing with. So the Transformers are there. They got they're in the world. They're just kind of showing you how they're they're interacting right now with it. So they're building that. And then they kind of reveal that somebody's you know, being presented to a, uh, a, a transformer. Um, and then obviously you get the reveal of Megatron later on and, uh, Optimus prime at the very, very end. And you're like, okay, cool. Here we go. We got some, we got some big names and, and you know, we're, we're, we're starting to roll here, but yeah, it is first issue. One is a slow start. The preview itself, you get sound wave and that's it, right? It's just, and he's buried in the ice. I I I give them the you know the the build up for this because it was for me at at 2002 this was exciting for me to kind of read through it I was I was in I was into the the slow burn getting into the 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 first series because I was really like you desperate for some new you know, some new content I didn't know how how desperate I was but I was really excited to be getting something new. So as I read through it, I was like, okay, there's somebody. There's somebody. Okay, there's somebody. Oh, Megatron. Uh, Optimus. All right, cool. All right, now we're rolling. And then, it, you know, and for me personally, I had bought issues one, two, and three at the same time. So I'm like, let's go. Issue two, let's go. And, you know, I just kept rolling with it. For me, it was it was a pretty good first start. Um, I personally liked it, uh, quite a bit. The art, it doesn't hold up. Uh, it's it, for 2002, <laughs> it was, uh, it was good enough for me because I was just kind of getting back into comics myself and I was just happy to be getting anything. Looking back on it now, it definitely doesn't hold up when you've got the likes of Alex Mill, Nick Roach, uh, Sarah Peter DeRoche, uh, Guido Guidi, uh, you know, uh, Andrew Griffith. The list can go on and on of just these quality, quality Transformers artists that we have working in the business right now. And you're looking at what uh, Dreamwave was putting out uh, at the time. It's it's just it's just too much. Even the Optimus on the very last panel, like how long is his neck? Right. I mean that neck <laughs> is are a problem insane. in the entire issue. Right. Like yeah. insane the the uh, the neck on this guy at the time. So yeah. Um. He, you know, it's just it. It did the trick at the time, and I was fine with it. Right, I was a naive uh, early twenties and just getting back into comics for you know my adult comic reading life. Kids' comic reading life was done, and I was finished with it. I was just getting back into being a, a collector for an adult. Cool. And uh, Jeremy, what were your thoughts? Well. I'm going to have to also separate myself now from myself in my early twenties. Um, because you know, we were coming off of, uh, we have beast wars, beast machines. And then like the year before this, we had the RID 2001, which was like basically like the first real reboot, but we haven't really had G one transformers stories for a long time at this point. So this was just like kind of, the, the first punch of that eighties nostalgia that was going to just take over for a while. And I just remember seeing this and just going nuts and see around this time, you know, I was really active in the message boards and stuff. And just, I remember seeing the images and just going insane about like, we had never seen art like this for the, you know, in the comics, it's completely modern looking at the time. And now rereading this, I'm looking through and, like you mentioned the neck on Optimus on that last panel. I'm looking at the necks of the humans mm -hmm. and like, particularly there's one with spike where it's like, how is that neck even holding up a set? It's so long. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, it's, it's horrible. And yeah. then you have, and this is going to be a, a, pers a continuation with the next issue, the Arctic scenes. One, you're riding in a Jeep with no roof. <laughs> And you're not wearing any headgear at all. And, you know, I'm relatively new to living in areas that get snow, like maybe like 10 years worth of my life. I've lived in areas that get snow, maybe 15. I don't know. But regardless, I know this, they're going to get frostbite within minutes. <laughs> it, 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 that's so dumb. 
I don't know. It, it was hard for me to get past that in my rereading now. I didn't even notice it then because I was living in the southern U.S. and I didn't know what snow was. <laughs> <laughs> but you would think that people living in Canada might know when when they were writing and drawing. Them. Well, that's why we didn't put it in because we don't need a we don't need a hat when we're riding in a jeep <laughs> oh, snow. Right. But I mean, the the overall story, you know, I, I I enjoyed the intrigue and linking it with the cartoon. Facial expressions were also were always an issue. Uh, the the robots never really looked menacing, but I, I like the whole mind control plot that they have here. And then yeah, seeing the Optimus at the end, that was just like such a big surprise at the time. I think I really the the thing I really enjoyed out of the entire book was that last page with the the newspaper article. Where you're just getting all of this background, just you know, in text, mm-hmm. and you know that probably stoked my excitement for the series more than anything because you're like, oh wow, this is all the stuff that has happened between the cartoon and this comic, you know, and then you know, it's such high expectations for this book and for the the series and everything. Yeah, it it, it definitely has its issues, but it's a product of its time. But I just, I don't know. It, it's hard to get past the art, but you know, what can you do? It, yeah, and I do give it points, though, for also, I mean, the other thing about bringing it in, you know, saying we're, you know, we're making this for adults who mm-hmm. want the Transformers to be updated. Like, you start off with a Transformer murdering two people and, like, yeah. you know, you see blood spatter and everything, so... That's definitely the signal. Like this is going to be a more adult focused story. Like you know, and yeah, giant robots would actually kill people. It's not just you know. Yeah, it's I mean, not like your Saturday morning cartoon. <laughs> Megatron would definitely step on a human. I yeah. mean, he probably wouldn't even necessarily do it on purpose. He's not caring that there was, you know, like you would step on an ant. You don't care. Hmm. So yeah, and uh. So we also, uh, Yoshi uh, expressed uh, he wanted to be in on this, unfortunately couldn't make it, Uh, but he did record his thoughts on uh, this first issue, Uh, although (laughs) he recorded a lot of thoughts, so we kind of pared it down a little bit uh, just because to fit into the constraints of the show, (laughs) so... Uh, maybe we'll we'll put the the full thing up as a as a bonus or something. But uh, let's hear what Yoshi has to say about uh, Transformers Generation One Number One. Uh, the assignment was to read issue zero and issue one, which I've done, and uh, the the memories came flooding back, and they came flooding back hard. I I was flipping through this book, guys. Like I couldn't read it fast enough, and I stopped myself and I slowed myself. And I, I, I would read a page like wicked quick and then I'd read it slowly. And I, I really enjoyed diving back into this just because this for me was so personal. Um, and no wonder issue one sold like crazy. I, it, it, the timing couldn't have been better. I mean, nostalgia, uh, kids from the eighties having their own money, um, and a book that is a beautiful mystery, a beautiful mystery. Um, and it's, it's hard not to look at it like, like Batman or Superman or whether it's the comics or, or the movies. Like they have, to, they have to reboot these franchises. They have to massage, adjust, and, and change the backstory a little bit. And they also don't want to repeat too much of everything everybody knows and make it new and feel fresh. And for this first issue, or issue zero and issue one, they're both just such good mysteries that no wonder people couldn't wait to get their hands on it. No wonder it was selling like crazy, especially at, I mean, the nostalgia factor is going to get people like me to buy this shit, whatever it comes in whatever form. But once word got out about the story, especially after these first two issues, no wonder they had trouble keeping it on the shelves. And, and... You know, applaud a, an applaud goes out to the writer and to the artist here, Pat Lee, and, and that they they nailed this. They, this this first issue, um, 
you know, I say all this stuff, and in the back of my head, I can hear some sort of correction coming from Charles. So feel free to pause now, Charles, and correct me so I can look like a, a perfect dumbass for the rest of this recording. But, okay, so, so yeah, the it's just... It's it's a great mystery and a beautiful tease. Issue zero. What the hell is going on here? And then boom at the ba- at the last page, sound wave. Like, man, if I was if I wasn't liking the story or I wasn't liking the art, which I don't understand how any warm blooded human being couldn't, that image of sound wave lying in the snow. That would get you. I mean, this is this is an, a tactical assault on our childhood in a beautiful way from the f- front of writing and art and and nostalgia. Just damn. And then you get you get the you, you get that in issue one. You know, you get what the hell's going on with Spike? What that and and Daniel and why the fuck are they in Ohio? Like you don't. You don't piece that shit together until the fucking news clips at the end of the at the end of the the, the two page news spread at the end of the comic book, which was fun to read. Sad, but fun to read. But you know, here you you got this you got this reboot taking place in in the early two thousands. You've got the seriousness of a Batman comic book. You've got militaries involved, and they're acting like militaries. You've got. Uh, I don't know who the villain, who the bad guys are, or why they're 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 who they are yet. I'm, I I have to reread all of this and remember it. Um, but uh, you know, you get you get to look at Hound. You know, just what the why is he being so? Everything about this is a mystery. Like, why is Hound being so complacent? Are these bad guys? Is that why Hound's being? Is Hound under their control? You get in there and you get Megatron standing or sitting in his in a throne like chair where they've trying to sell you on the fact we have complete control but that fucker won't kneel he won't kneel and then as they leave the room you get that red flash like okay megatron's still the asshole we know like this is great like but what's going on why is he playing dumb or is he playing dumb you know this is, it's the questions and the mystery that made it really hard for me not to open up issue two before recording this guys and i really really hope you all have the same feelings and have the same nostalgic pull that i do because i'm looking forward to listening to this episode and hearing what you guys have to say but then the book issue one this isn't this isn't our this isn't our childhood comic book you got a, you got megatron killing people Hand comes in in the forest, squished. This is, this is different. This is darker. This is you've got dark writing is what you have. Juxtaposition with beautiful art. Honestly, I don't, I don't, I don't understand, and I don't remember all the Pat Lee drama that we've talked about on the show. It, I, I just, I'm not focused on it. I, I know there's issues there. Regardless of where credit is due or what have you, the art is beautiful. Um, it, it's the art and the story writing are having the same effect on me in these two issues that Yanniger's art had on me in Generation Two. Like we gotta, we gotta. It, uh, I, I don't. Even, it's just beautiful art. The writing is beautiful. The art is beautiful. The the nostalgia pull, like the mystery, like how can you not enjoy this first issue? How can how can you not read it and be like, I have to wait another month for issue two? Are you fucking kidding me? How can you not be that way? Ah, oh, Charles, quit nagging in the back of my head. Please be on my side on this. Damn, this is so good. Ah, man, I hope when we do issue two, I can be on the show. Because if not, you're going to get another one of these fucking pre-recorded spasmastic reports from me. All right. Well, I think we disappointed Yoshi. (laughs) (laughs) But uh, wow, 
very uh very positive high praise from yoshi so i think the nostalgia hit him uh, hit him right between the eyes there so but yeah it's sorry we, we sorry we didn't share we didn't quite share your enthusiasm but uh i think that means if you come back on the show we could have a good discussion so i wonder if yoshi's high come back. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a double rainbow across the sky. <laughs> so beautiful. That guy wasn't high either, was he? He was just really excited. He was really high, Charles. <laughs> he was extremely high. He shouldn't have posted that to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> no, he should have. He should have. And he did. And we're all better for it. <laughs> Well, yeah. So, I mean, I I think uh, it's it, you know it's interesting to look back. I mean, we're we're almost twenty years away from this, so it's it's just interesting to see how this shaped uh, Transformers comics going forward. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think we'll we'll have we'll have more things to talk about later in the series. I think I mean we might just go through the whole six issue run since uh, we're not getting any new comics for a little while. Trevor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think this first issue, I, it's still, this is still kind of, we see the, the honeymoon, it, it's got a lot of potential, but, uh, I, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a, th- things fall apart later on in the series, at least that's, that's how I, that, that's how I, I feel looking back on it. And even at the time I felt like the, the end of the series didn't really live up to the potential of the beginning, but. So I agree. I agree a little bit with Yoshi. It was exciting at the time. I, looking back mm-hmm. on it, I can't. I can't see the. You know, I can't agree with the amount of nostalgia glasses he's wearing. I. I, I, I don't. I don't <laughs> see that. But uh, at the time, I was super hyped on this man. It was really good. Mm-hmm. But uh, but yeah, no. Looking back on it with uh, you know, you know, with the stuff that we've been given, uh, yeah, I see the issues. I see. I see problems with it. Mm-hmm. All right, well, uh, that is our review of Transformers Generation 1, number one from Dreamwave. And uh, we will move on to media news. All right, and uh, in media news this week, it seems like this story just keeps getting uh, copied and pasted every week. Uh, Transformers War for Cybertron and Rise of the Dark Spark video games, their multiplayer servers are discontinued too. So it it feels like we keep talking about the same thing, but it's Activision just shutting down more servers for uh, different games. So uh, previously it was the War for Cybertron, Fall of Cybertron games. Now it's it's the um, Rise of the Dark Spark. So... That's the uh, that's the one that everyone wants to forget. So, um, if you were playing <laughs> that, why? Uh, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and now, if you're still playing it, uh, you're just doing the campaign. So, congratulations. Um, I do have that game, and I've never finished it. I just got tired of it. Um, yeah, so that's being shut down. So, there you go. Um, and the only other topic we have for media news this week is another Soundtrack Saturdays. This is another piece of music that is composed by Robert J. Walsh and Johnny Douglas. And it's part of the Hasbro Studios Presents 80s TV Classics Music from the Transformers vinyl release uh, from 2018. And this is from uh, uh, the show. It's another piece of instrumental music. It's a Decept- uh, Decepticon type of music or bad guy music um you can take a listen to it there and and as soon as you hear it you'll be able to place it from uh from different parts of the g1 show uh it's very distinctive so take a listen and that's it for media news all right and we will finish up the show with feedback And first up, we have a voicemail from Donatrion John 4X Levengood. Hi, guys. John 4X Levengood here again. In the recent alt mode, you guys asked what 
our thoughts are on uh, Transformer Cyberverse, and uh, I wanted to throw my two cents in. Um, like a lot of people at the very beginning, I kind of wasn't exactly sure, especially with the non-talking Bumblebee. That's always been a, a kind of irksome to me, uh, especially after the, you know, it feels like they kept going on with it. However, I'm glad they worked through that and got that knocked figured out. Um, I really liked, uh, like a lot of other people, I found that uh, season two really picked up. I am personally enjoying their their take on Grimlock. I really enjoy the uh, more smart, cognitive uh, Grimlock, kind of almost refined, uh, versus the comic relief Grimlock in T-Rex mode. Uh I've uh, gotten through the first four uh, episodes on uh, net, on uh, YouTube. Uh, I am personally waiting for them to come out on YouTube to watch them, because that's the way I am. <laughs> uh, anyhow, um, I'm really enjoying this series. I, I'm liking that death has a, a real meaning in this series. And that, uh, you know, and I'm really enjoying the takes and finding all, all sorts of fun with all the gags. Anyhow, that's uh, all I have to say for now. Again, guys, uh, keep up the good work. Bye. John is correct. <laughs> all his opinions are correct. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I totally agree with with John on uh, Cyberverse. Uh, I felt the same way about Bumblebee. You know, I'm always uh, not interested in Bumblebee not talking, so I'm glad that they did away with that at, after season one. And uh, I just think the the show the show is just a strong ensemble Transformers show, and gives a lot of space to a lot of different characters. It takes some familiar characters in different directions. Grimlock, in particular, that was a, that was a good mention. I think uh, what they've done with RC this season, I think that's um, at the end that they they gave us a little glimpse at the end of season two, and then in season three she gets a little bit more um, you know, spotlight. Uh, Windblade, I think, is a standout character. Uh, we get you know lots of other characters that you know you haven't, you don't really get to see shine. Um, uh, new characters like Clobber and uh, Dead End are are really good. It's uh, yeah, it's just a fun show. I would argue one point: the um, the Grimlock voice. I always thought would have would have been a better suited to ratchet for whatever reason. I mm. cannot get behind the voice that they have on ratchet. It's, it's very whiny. And mm. I was like, when they, when they first uh, uh, showed uh, Grimlock in season one, I'm like, that voice sounds much more like professory. And I get that. Yes. They're going for a different, you know, take for robot mode as opposed to, uh, dinosaur mode and I, I it's it's a good juxtaposition between the two but um his his voice for uh for robot mode I always figured could have been a uh, a ratchet voice and um you could have picked something or put the put the goofy the goofier voice from ratchet to Grimlock I don't know it's just that voice that he uses uh for Grimlock I I just figured would have been a much better ratchet voice yeah, I mean, I I think in general the um the voices are fine. I think it does. I mean, these are like these are non screen actor or voice like the voice actor yeah. actors union guild voices. So I think in, Something in, in general, there. You're, yeah. <laughs> in, in general, I mean, it's going to be slightly lower tier because these are not the you know these are not the top tier voice talent. But I think they, I think everyone for the most part did a good job. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I do, I still have issues with with Optimus Prime. I mean, in season back in season one, when it just happened once, we talked about Teletron. I mean, that continued throughout the whole series, and <laughs> that was annoying. And um, uh, the the Quintessens, of course, that's another <laughs> issue. That, I don't know why they keep pronouncing it Quintesson. But yeah, so those are minor Nick picks. <laughs> I'll just get over myself. <laughs> All right. Uh, and our last bit of feedback is uh, part two of the email from Donatrion Will. Uh, so he asked us a question in uh, 
in the toy show about our favorite toy line. Now he asks uh, about ID, not which non IDW comic artists are your favorites. Uh, and again, he, he, he says all the best, stay safe and healthy. I want to thank so Will for spelling favorites correctly. <laughs> it's with a Get U. Get that U out of here. Yeah, yeah, we know, we know, we know, Daryl. We know <laughs> you, can, you Canadians and you Brits with your U's adding U's everywhere that don't have no business being there. You lazy Americans can't put a, <laughs> can't put a U in there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so non-IDW comic artists, um, I've talked about this on the show before, but uh, for me, back in the 80s, Jeff Sr. made a big impression on me. Uh, He's worked for IDW. <laughs> okay, but he was originally not an are, IDW artist. Are we talking still just Transformers? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're we're focusing on Transformers. Uh, yes, this is still a Transformers podcast. Well, I understand, so. but the number of artists... I took it yeah, as really non non transformers outside of the uh, the fandom. I mean, you have Pat Lee. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, most everyone else of of note has worked for IDW at some point. So, I mean, I think oh, maybe we could can I modify it slightly pre IDW? How about that? How about well, just not drawing transformers comic artists? Yeah, because I didn't read the the Marvel comics until after we started doing this podcast. I mean, I think it's still. I mean, he would have said non Transformers <laughs> comics artists if he wanted non Transformers. Charles doesn't know any comic artists that don't draw Transformers. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Say your name. Eric names. Larson. Eric Larson. <laughs> I liked his Spider Man art. <laughs> Jeff Sr. is my favorite Transformers comics artist from back in the 80s. Really like Jeff Sr. And, uh, uh, Yoshi mentioned Derek Yaniger. I really like the G2 art and Derek, Derek Yaniger did. And Andrew Wildman, of course. Go. Give your non-Transformers comics artists. Go ahead, Daryl. <laughs> I've got a lot, actually. I, I am, I'm a fan of art, comic art, so I have quite a few. Uh, I mean, I have, like, I'm a big Barry Windsor Smith fan right now. I'm on a big of a, a bit of a kick of his. Uh, he, uh, he did a lot of the early Conan the Barbarian stuff. Uh, went on a hell of a run with uh, the uh, Wolverine uh, Weapon X stuff in the Marvel Presents or Marvel Comics Presents. Uh, he's very talented. I don't even know if he's still working on comics anymore, but uh, big fan of his. Uh, Adam Kubert and Andy Kubert, big fans of those guys as well. They uh, I came into them through X Men, and uh, they did some really really good stuff that I'm still a big fan of. Um, uh, classic stuff. Neil Adams is still, still, he's pretty awesome. I have a lot of his uh, old stuff. He's, uh, he's really good. Uh, J Scott Campbell. He's uh, really good. He usually only does covers, which kind of suck because he could, when he used to do books, like whole books, they were amazing. Um, yeah, man, there's so many Mark Bagley on Spider-Man, Todd McFarlane. Um, I liked Eric Larson. He did some good stuff, but uh, but Mark Bagley is who was drawing Spider Man when I got into him. Um, I think uh, I think the probably the biggest guy uh, that I'm into right now that uh, I didn't draw IDW at all is Jack Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> um, he's dead. Uh, but uh, <laughs> he died before IDW <laughs> came into existence. Probably. <laughs> I, I think so. But uh, but no, it's uh, he's. He's a big influence on a lot of artists, and I just uh, I've been in, in awe of the stuff that he was putting out. I've been collecting a lot of the old '60s comics, and a lot of them are like plotted and co-written and arted by Jack Kirby. And I'm like, this is just one book, and he did four books that month. I'm like, how did he do this? <laughs> like, this guy was just in a, a machine, and I'm just. I'm impressed every time I pick up another book that I'm, you know, that he did. And, you know, they were all 20 page books and they're, they're just, it's great. He was, he was the master. That's why they call him the King. So yeah. Jeremy. Well, I was a non trans or non IDW transformers artist. I'll just say Matt Moylan. I've got a few sketches from him. As far as I know, he hasn't done any IDW work except for maybe a cover here and there. 
right, that's it. No Dan Jurgens <laughs> from you? No, yeah, I'm kidding. Uh, Dan Jurgens is always, is a big favorite. Like I, I was like in high school when I was like really in my first big getting comics like regularly. I was reading his Superman run. Darwin Cook, who did the New Frontier series on DC, I, I like that retro mm-hmm. kind of simplistic look that he came up with. Kind of IDW related. I mean, he did a few covers during the Dark Cybertron era, but um, Phil Jimenez is just he does like in in the the vein of um, of George Perez, who's also great. Mm. He seems to pack so many people into an image. It's just amazing. And then in the modern day, um, Patrick Gleason, his stuff on Superman was really good. Before Bendis came, he did the the Rebirth Superman series with Peter Tomasi. And I just, I, I adore that series. So pretty much it I can think of right now. A lot of great right. artists. A lot of great artists out there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, Will, let us know what your favorite artists are um, and if, uh, you know, what do you think of some of our picks here? And that will do it for this episode of Transmissions Alt Mode. Thanks, everyone, for listening, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Later. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of Transmissions. But just because this episode is over doesn't mean the Transformers fun has to stop. Join us and other Transformers fans on our Discord chat server by visiting transmissionspodcast.com slash Discord. If you would like to learn more about how you could support the Transmissions Podcast, just visit transmissionspodcast.com slash support. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you again next week.